Hey, Justin, how are you? I'm very well, and you, Joe, it's good to see you. Good to be back. Yeah, very, very, very good. I'm excited for our conversation today, um, in particular because we're doing something a little different, and uh, I'm excited to see how that goes and how that plays out between the two of us. Um, yeah, me too, very much so. Um, like, like we always say in our, in, at the beginning, at the end of our shows, um, we really appreciate uh, the likes, the follows, and, uh, and most importantly, feedback. And Jodes, we've, we've taken some feedback on board and we've uh, and looked at making a little bit of a change. So hope, I hope that the viewers uh, like it. Yeah, same. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Um, so I suppose the, the big shift is to try and keep things a little bit more current, right? So over the past weekend, um, you know, try and, try and be more current with our thoughts on mental performance and sort of see where that takes us week in and week out. Uh, by looking at what actually is happening in the world of sports or what has happened and what has been there that sort of stood out for us in terms of things that we can talk about, and maybe bring an insight into what could potentially be happening on the inside of people, not so much just on the outside in terms of the things that we see. So, Absolutely. Um, to, to get us going, was there anything specific for you this weekend that stood out? There were a couple of things. Um, the 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 one I want to kick off with is uh, what happened in the Abidjan Formula One Grand Prix over the weekend. I don't know if you caught the highlights of that, um, and are, are are aware of 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 what I might be alluding to. Um, but yeah, there was a really interesting incident um, between some of the front runners on the penultimate lap of the race, um, uh, and that had come on the back of a really exciting battle. Or second, third, and fourth, and even first, second, third, and fourth in the race. Um, the incident I'm referring to, Jodes, uh, is something that happened between uh, Sergio uh, Perez of Red Bull and um, Carlos Sainz of Ferrari. Um, they were dicing with uh, with Leclerc, um, uh, Sainz's teammates, uh, for second, third, and fourth. And in the midst of all of that, on the penultimate lap, Perez and um, Saints touched, and the result was they both crashed into the wall and and lost a podium potentially for each of them, but uh, um, big points for their teams. Mm. Yeah, I I did manage to see a little bit of it. I didn't watch the whole race because I had to go out sort of midway through it. But um, I think the sort of hearing about it afterwards and thinking about what that what that could mean from a mental performance point of view and what's happening in these people's, you know, what in these athletes' minds. I mean, ultimately, they are athletes, right? They're some of the fittest human beings in the world um, to be able to put their bodies through that level of rigor, right? And so I think the first thing, where, first place where my head went was these guys are pushing the boundaries, right? They're pushing the edge. they like living in that space and not necessarily just in that moment. Uh, in their sport, <laughs> they're taking cars and they throwing them around um, race tracks all around the world at excessive speeds, speeds that we wouldn't even be able to much probably contemplate from a uh, you know normal human being driving your car down the road point of view. And so I think that, that, that that's the first place my mind went was like they're really at the edge. They're pushing the boundary. They they're they're you know, but then at the same time, I have this realization that, hang, maybe this isn't the edge for them. You know, maybe they're it because they've trained for it, because they do it so often, because they, you know, that's what they do. That's what they train to do. Maybe that wasn't the edge for them. Maybe, you know, two laps to go, podium place on the line. And so, yeah, we race. And, and I suppose they love doing that and they enjoy the challenges that come from that and they enjoy the, well, there's a level of satisfaction most probably at, at doing what they're doing. And so there was a moment when they are now racing each other, cars touch and then some bad things happen. I suppose uh, it's good that the technology around safety has gone up in that sport because both of them seem kind of hate to it. And they were able to talk to media and things like that. But if you look at their cars, it wasn't a pretty sight. Yeah, it's a, it's a real testament to, to modern Formula One safety, for sure. 
Yeah. Um, I, I, I like what you say though about, um, you know, bringing in the fact that these guys are, first of all, they are supreme athletes. Uh, they're super fit, um, physically. Um, and, uh, and surely you need to be super fit mentally to operate, uh, um, a machine with, with, with that kind of power traveling at over 300 Ks an hour on a street circuit where the smallest mistake, um, or lapse in concentration over a long race can end up with you being in the wall. Um, and that's just driving on your own without somebody right behind you, hassling you, trying to overtake you, um, at every opportunity, um, which was the case in, 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 in point here. Um, you know, there were, there was a lot of toing and throwing and, and opportunities taken. Um, and, and I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, are these guys really on the, on the ragged edge? Are they on the limits? Um, we're talking about the best 20 odd drivers in the world here. Um, regardless of the car that they're driving in. So just because the, there's a guy at the front of the field who's, who's uh, uh, winning multiple championships and many others, the guys at the back aren't, you know, weekend drivers because they're not winning races. They're, they're the best of the best. Um, it comes down to the machinery and the, and, and the package that the team gives them uh, for the season um, and a lot of other things as well. Um, I want to make it clear that, that um, I'm... I'm I'm not pro uh, either of uh, the two protagonists in this instance, Perez and 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 Saints, in the, in the sense that I portion blame to one or the other. In fact, um, the stewards deemed this to be a racing incident, so there will not be any penalties handed out, um, and and it's deemed that it's it's the nature of racing. And and to your point about being on the edge or not, I think. Um, you know, some of these drivers are clearly they're all very skilled. You have to be skilled to be there. But I think the, there's a level of, of, of difference between the really, really good guys who, who win titles on a regular basis and have won titles and those that don't seem to. They seem to uh, have a little bit of extra capacity. So having the mental acumen um, and ability to, to race at, qu at close quarters and to deal with very complicated machines. Um, and, and in this case, racing on a street circuit, but then also have additional mental capacity to, to rationalize other things happening, potential things going on or going wrong before they happen, uh, calculating points in their mind and, and other things like that, which I find fascinating as well. Yeah, I would imagine that in that moment, they're not too worried about that. And, and most probably if they are taking their minds into a place where they're worried about the podium or they're worried about and maybe worry is not the best word, even just focusing or paying attention to that type of thinking in their mind, in all likelihood, that'll lead to mistakes on the road. Because they're not as present as they can be in that moment. And who knows, maybe it was a racing incident, but maybe that's the kind of thing that led to that. You know, like I'm racing this guy, there's a podium on the line here. I hope I can, <laughs> you know, I hope I can get there. I hope I, hope I can do this. And, uh, uh, I think both of them have already signed contracts for next year. So I'm sure that's not something that's necessarily at play. Maybe it's just a bit of a status or bravado or uh, somebody like Perez has been outdone by Max, I suppose, for a long period of time. And here was an opportunity for him to get onto the podium, maybe bring a bit of, in inverted commas, honor back to his name. Um, and sort of it ended up, again, in the same place for him as, as quite a lot of racers do, right? Seemingly for him that he's crashing out or he's, something goes wrong with the car. And so I'm, I'm curious maybe about what the mental stuff is that sits behind that for Perez, even though it might not have been part of this incident, but just in his general sort of day-to-day, -day, all the pressures that he's facing within that team and how that, uh, potentially affects his ability to drive in the moment on the on the racetrack. Um, who hit who there? I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on that. <laughs> well, I, I think you get a different answer depending on on who you support. <laughs> um, um, and I don't even, I don't even want to go into that because yeah, okay, so that uh, was a, yeah, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of conjecture about it. Okay. I mean, I, I well, think and I read a lot about it, and 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 clearly Ferrari fans will will point to to um, Perez hitting Saints and uh, Red Bull fans will point to Saints hitting um, Perez. I, I don't think that's the, the, that really is the, the, the key here because it, it was deemed to be a racing incident. Yeah. So no, I, just... I think 
I was just curious, yeah. right? because I didn't get to see it. So I was just curious because let's just say it was a period sort of initiated thing. Then maybe some of the things I have to, the thoughts I have about him and the pressures he might be experiencing, that they could be validity to him pushing, say, potentially right. a little bit harder in a moment. Yeah. Versus, Look, I think, I think versus they, if it wasn't it, him and he was just sort of properly racing, then I suppose it makes a difference, right? And, and, and maybe that's something I just want to highlight here in the conversation is that this is what makes the mental game so difficult at times to know and understand about people. I mean, we're sitting here and we're thumb sucking, right? Essentially. Armchair about, warriors, yeah. About, yeah. What, about what could be going on there and what we could potentially learn, but we actually don't know. Nobody no, really knows. Don't. Only those two individuals will know. And hey, if they were sort of in flow a little bit and made a bit of a mistake, even they might not know, because often we can't remember what we're doing in performance when we're really in it. And so um, it's, it's maybe a great thing to highlight, right? That, that we don't necessarily, we're not always aware of. And so our training tends to take over. I, I mean, I'm reminded uh, of um, sort of in the back of my mind throughout our conversation here so far about a guy like Alex Arnold who climbed El Capitan uh, it's a 3,000 foot, roughly about a kilometer high for those people who work in, in the metric system. Um, 3,000 foot just sounds more impressive. It sounds way more impressive. Way more impressive. Let's, but, stick, let's stick to feet. Let's stick to feet, right? <laughs> Even though neither of us really get it. <laughs> well, no, we, we, we don't come from a place of dealing in feet. No, no we don't. No. <laughs> Unless you're referring to height. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, but I mean, so what he did was he climbed that mountain without rope. And so to me, as an ordinary person, Amazing. I go like, I go like, wow, this is insane, right? Like, how do you actually do that? No ropes. They're bonkers. Bonkers. No. Shoes, some chalk in the pockets. Let's go. But if you actually delve into that story and his story, it, it was a 10 year journey from the start. We thought, geez, this would be great. He's a free soloist. So he, he climbs mountains like that as a general sort of thing that he does. Um, so he didn't just wake up one morning and decide to go and climb El Capitan. He planned it, right? Exactly. A lot of planning went into it. A lot of planning. It. And if you watch the movie, I think Free Solo, not I think, Free Solo, he, it sort of explains and he, and he, at times, and I'm sure they don't give all the details, but at times he details how he practiced certain parts of the route. There's a right. part where he had to almost like jump to get a hold of a thing. And he went down specifically, walked to the top of the mountain, rappelled down, and just practice that one section until he felt comfortable enough that he could do it without rope. In the same That's way, right. he rappelled down the mountain with backpacks and they removed rocks and put them in the backpacks and went up back to the top to clear the route of any potential hazards that could land him in trouble. And so, you know, I think it's a, the reason I have this story sort of floating in the back of my mind with regards to the Perez uh, Saints incident is, that idea of these are highly trained people at the top of their game, uh, the best in the world. And so maybe they're not living on the edge. However, you know, they're in, in that moment, something happened there that they were racing each other and whatever it was that they were racing for, then had an outcome. Uh, sometimes it could be something like bad blood. You know, maybe it wasn't in this case, really not. I don't know the interpersonal dynamics there, mm. but it could be something like that. You know, you and I have a bit of a history. We have a bit of a thing. And so I'm going to go for it this time. And oh, well, it didn't come off. We were racing each other, you know. Um, I'm sure that happens on a, on a regular basis with, with people who, who, who are in, in close combat in whatever uh, form of sport that they're in on a regular basis. I want to add something else just about, the, about this Formula One incident. And, and that is, you know, they're, they're racing drivers. And, and the old adage is if there's a gap, the racing, a true racing driver is going to go for that gap. Right. Um, they believe they're going to make it. Um, and, and, and if you watch a lot of racing, uh, it happens a lot where guys come together and, and with modern, uh, coverage of sport these days, we get to hear both drivers, uh, and what their comment was. And they always blame the other one, right? It's always, yeah, he, the idiot, he cut me off or what's he doing? Uh, he didn't leave me enough space or there was clearly a gap. I was ahead, right? So the usual story. And, and, and a lot of that went into this as well. Um, but yes, um, I, I completely agree with you about, about your point. Yeah. I think maybe just, I want to throw last little comment just from my side on this is I think where this and how this could be relevant for us is 
ordinary people, if I can say it like that, you know, not racing as drivers mere mortals, or elites. Yes. As mere mortals, not elite athletes, not at the top of their game. Uh, maybe you are an elite athlete listening into this. So I, I think how this is relevant for, for the everyday person is we will always be exposed to things, right? And so some of us are living our lives at the edge. We're living our lives at the edge of what we're, um, our, 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 our bodies have been trained for, our stress and tension levels. And so I think that if, if you are the type of person that's living constantly in that, you're living constantly in a place of stress and anxiety, and maybe this is because of your job, maybe it's because of consistent underperformance over a season, maybe this is because of finances, maybe it's because of a relationship strain, um, th then, then I want to encourage you to seek help. Firstly, you know, there's always somebody that, that you know that would be willing to help or listen. You know, you've got to find a way and a place to open up and talk about it. But secondly, if you're, if you're, if you're sort of, if the stress and the anxiety is there because you're sort of pushing yourself ahead, because you're stretching yourself, because you're leveling up, you know, maybe you're a cricketer pursuing a, pursuing your goal of one day becoming a professional. And so every time you go out, there's, there will always in sport be a level of tension. Then part of what you have to learn to do is to get used to, in inverted commas, that level of tension. And so we've got to find ways to practice that and expose our body and our mind more to that pressure. So almost like to build up a tolerance to it. Again, doing this in healthy sort of ways, ways that support your growth and development is always better than just blindly throwing yourself into places and it actually does more harm than good. So one of the ways that I think you could do that potentially would be to say, uh, let's say you're an, a, 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 a cricketer, right? Because I used that already. Let's say you're a cricketer and you're playing under 11 cricket. Maybe you could play some under 12 cricket games or under 13 cricket games. Just see what the challenge is. I'm not saying that if your skill level's not up to it, to expose yourself to that sort of consistently and regularly, because that could do more harm than good. But it is to at least go push the boat out a little bit so to speak so that you get an experience for that and then you can come back take the lesson and work and learn and keep going you know often people who what what if excuse me interrupting sure. you Josh, but what what if in that case you you're unable to do that um are there ways that you can um sort of uh, modulate uh pressurize situations in your practice environment um and and put and, and sort of practice under under uh, artificially created pressurized situation yeah definitely so it could be little things like asking a coach to throw quicker at you you know i'm used to them throwing at a certain speed so let's increase the pace uh increase the difficulty maybe by the type of surface that you play on increase the difficulty by swinging the ball more or spinning the ball more and so in that way you can you can do your best practice will never really quite be like performance but you can do your best to at least bring a level of exposure of the next level or next levels into your training environment. Um, cool. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Good yeah. advice. Yeah. What, um, were there any other incidents that, uh, were there any incidents or, 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 or sporting snippets that caught your fans? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's this guy, right? Uh, he won this PGA, uh, tournament this weekend. I'm actually not sure which tournament. Uh, because I think the tournament wasn't as important knowing which one he won wasn't as important for me as the fact that he won. And I think what stuck out, stood out sorry, for me was uh, the guy's name is Peyton Kezire. I hope I'm saying oh, that correctly. You, I know who you're talking about. Peyton Kezire. Yeah. The guy, the guy who won the Pro Core Championship in Napa. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, right? So yeah. what stood out for me in the story um, or in this event is the fact that this is the first time in six years that he's won. He made his debut as a PGA golfer, I think in 2017 or 2016. He won in 2017, won in 2018, and then nothing. So six years of just the graph. So I looked, I, I, I looked it's, into it's him insane. a little bit. I mean, I looked into him a little bit then. So he, he won out of 242. PGA tournaments he's played in, he has, um, I think, 141 times he made the cut. In, in other words, about 100 times, he didn't even get through to the place where you earn the money. 
so he was sort of cut a hundred times. I think he had something like 10, 25, top 25 finishes, something like that, or maybe 10 top 10 finishes and 25 top 25 finishes. I'm not a hundred percent sure on those stats, but if, if, if you look at it, right? So what, what's he been doing for six years? Like what, what, what has he actually been doing the last six years that he has a person that's on the PGA, this is his job and essentially he's failed for six years straight. Yeah, and how's he, how's he dealing with all those failures and, and keeping going and keeping motivated and getting up every day and doing it all over again? Yeah. You know, and so I, 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 I'm, 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 I, I think that's what fascinates me because so many athletes I work with, one of the first things that we speak about is failure. But one of the first, or one of the biggest things that has an impact in their ability to perform at their best is what happens when they fail. Um, or when things don't go their way. And this might be, I had two bad weekends. Yeah, we're talking about a guy who's had thick years of weekends potentially, you know, and maybe little glimmers of hope here and there, but for the most part, he's not, it hasn't been going that great. And so in spite of that, he's kept going because yeah, he is and he's, and he's, and he's won again, you know? And so I think it, to me, that fascinates me. Um, I, I, mean, I, 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 yeah, it's crazy. I mean, yeah. I, I also, I, I spotted that, um, I didn't recognize the name. So I went and had a look, um, and, um, I looked at, I looked up, you know, where he's been, what he's been doing, who is this guy? Um, and I came across a, a video, um, out there, um, which was, which was taken just after he won the tournament and it, it looked like some kind of a media briefing or. Uh, interview session with a, b a bunch of media asking him questions and what i found really fascinating from a mental performance perspective is uh w one of the one of the journalists no noted that um he'd been writing something in his yard book um and had heard that it was not necessarily to do with with golf but to do with the mental side of his game and uh, it was really interesting what he said he said he wrote down in his yard book he wrote down i am here i am now um, and when pushed a little bit more about that, he said that um, he's been working really hard on his mental game. And what's important for him um, is to stay in the same frame of mind the whole week. So the duration of the tournament. And, and this was something he did um, in an attempt to, to, to achieve just that. And he kept reading it to himself over and over uh, and keeping himself in that frame of mind. Um, and he said, it's, it's, it's about not listening to the doubt. It's about not listening to the doubt and staying positive. And I thought that was re really interesting. I thought that would, that would interest you as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, whenever we make an I am type statement, so we go, I am, I am here, I am now, right? The, the I am-ness of that statement speaks directly to identity. And identity is a, like, most probably it is the most important thing when it comes to sport performance and the mental game. It is the perception of self. It is how I view myself, my thoughts, my beliefs, my abilities, my skill about me in this performance with the sport. You know, like that, that's the, like if that's wonky in some or the other way, right? If, if, you're, if your self view is not supporting your performance, the likelihood of you performing is very small. All right. And so the, the interesting thing, though, is he doesn't make it's not like he's, he's judging himself through that statement. He's not going, I am great. I am the world's best. You know, I am. I am awesome, you know, or the opposite, potentially something like I suck at this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And, and, and so uh, he, he chooses to make it about something completely different, which is which sounds more process driven rather than judgment driven or um a critical sort of self-assessment or something like that versus i am here i am now to be in the present moment to to to, to be there we know that from a performance point of view that that intends to enhance or at least you're giving yourself the best chance to level uh your performance through um being more present the, the key thing with that would be, though, his ability to not just say those words, but actually like embody them and feel them 
in the moment. That's true. like often we can just say something in our cell, in our mind, but it's not a felt, felt done thing. You know, it's like, I am here. I am now. Okay, cool. Let me be present. Let me smell the grass. Let me feel my shoes on the feet. Let me uh, take in the scenes around me, the clouds, the sun, the, the trees, the green, the water, the wind that blows on my skin. And so I think the more we make that a felt experience, the more it enhances the probability of us getting into our best place uh, from a performance point of view. So what you're saying is, is those words that he's written down, that he, he has a, some significant meaning attached to those words. Um, and, and, and that's how it becomes uh, an important part of his process, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, as opposed to saying something just for the sake of saying it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily, um, I, I think that would be an assumption, right? That there's meaning associated with it, but that would be my hope. That would be my understanding that if there's a mean, meaning associated to that, and who knows, maybe that's what he did in the last six years, is he was learning about this stuff and how he could, how he could uh, sort of be more in the moment. Maybe six years ago, he found like he was worried too much about the outcome. I won twice and I need to win again. I need to win again. I'm sure there was more lessons than that over the last six years, but I'd imagine that somebody that keeps doing something for six years, they're busy learning and they're busy growing and they're busy evolving. And the hope would be that, yes, there's some meaningfulness associated with that or attached to that, that he's done work with a psychologist or a mental performance coach or whatever. And, you know, it's not just sort of empty words that he's speaking to himself. It's words that it really maybe like grounds him, really gets him into the moment because there's things attached to it more than just the words themselves. Got you. My, my, my sense is, my sense also uh, out, of, out of what you're saying um, and, and looking at this particular instance is um, being consistent with working on your mental game is the key as opposed to only deciding to work on it if you're going through a slump or you're having a tough time. Uh, working on your mental game should should have the same degree of importance and regularity as working on your diet, your fitness, your sleep, yeah. uh, your technical skills. Yeah, you know, you know, you know me. <laughs> you know, I believe in those same things, right? Um, the the I had this analogy about um, about the stuff, and I don't know if it's really that relevant, but maybe to give people sort of an idea about or an image in their mind as to how they can think about this. And so, if you imagine a clock on the wall. And we always see ourselves as that clock, right? What does a clock do? A clock just ticks. It, it, the, the, the second arm will just go click, 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 click. And then once it's done one round, the minute will go one. And once the minute has gone all around, the hours go, will go one. And, and so there's a process to the clock ticking. The clock isn't just magically sort of appearing to change its numbers and its figures on the screen. Slowly, 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 it's, it's ticking away and there's a process to time as it then winds around. Now, while the clock is doing this, to the clock, it doesn't matter what's happening in the room around it. It doesn't matter if there's a party yet. It doesn't matter if there's somebody crying in the room. It doesn't matter if the room's empty. It doesn't matter if there's a lot of people in the room. It doesn't matter if the room's busy burning down. It doesn't matter. The clock just keeps ticking Keep away and, ticking. and sticks with its process. And so I think from a performance, sporting performance point of view, I think it's for me personally, it's such a great analogy because athletes are often in environments surrounded by teammates, surrounded by fans, spectators, all of these sort of events and things that could be happening around them. But if we can be like a clock and we just say, right, I know what works for me. And so this is key. You need to know what works for you. Uh, that's the mental, that's what I think the mental coach does and the sports psychologist does is it teaches us strategies and helps us figure out how we are at our best. And so the more we can then just do those things, play that game, play the inner game, the more we do that, the more we do that, the more we do that, so the more we're able to show up in the present moment and just be there. I think you've just, you know, just I like, think the, you just, just like another nuggets. <laughs> Just like the I clock. think you have another nugget with your clock analogy there, really. <laughs> just, just like the clock is sort of just in the present, that every time it ticks, that's in the present moment. We can remain in the present moment consistently by engaging with our process rather than worrying about what's happening around us. And are we winning? Are we losing? Um, 
you know, it, this is a pitch that I like to play on or don't like to play on. Oh, I like facing that bowler or I don't like to. Or I enjoy this racing track if we go to Perez and then and I, or I don't enjoy this racing track. None of that's really relevant. If I know my process and I stick to that, then I'm giving myself the best chance to be present to unlock my best performance. Yeah, sorry. Maybe a little bit Very of a... Very cool. Yeah. No, I love it. Love it. All right. There's something else I want to chat about. Yes. Um, and I think that will, this be the last a... one for, will be the last one for today, right? Try and keep these things short, yeah. sharp, and sweet. Huh? Cool. Yeah. So so the other thing that, that um, just jumped out at me, I'm a, I'm a big football fan. I love to watch the Premier League. I won't give away who I support. Um, but I, I, I've noticed um, uh, some of the results uh, over the weekend, and, and I obviously got to watch some of the highlights as well. And I noticed that um, Everton uh, managed to lose um, a second game in a row after having been two goals to the good up. Mm. Um, and and I, I, I went and watched, because I had watched the, the first of the two games, um, the Premier League had a, a little bit of an international break um, to accommodate the Nations Cup. Um, and in the third round of the Premier League, um, I think it was Bournemouth that Everton played against. Um, they had lost their first two games of the season, so they were somewhere near the bottom of the log, no points, uh, doom and gloom start, and this was now their third game of the season. Um, they, were, they found themselves 2-0 up against Bournemouth. Um, I think there was very little time left in the game, so seemingly they were cruising to their first win, 2-0. And, and lo and behold, uh, Bournemouth came back and scored three goals in like 10, nine, 10 minutes to, to snap up the victory, snap up the points and, um, and, 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 and inflict a third, a third loss in a row to, to Everton. Then, as I mentioned, the, all the Premier League teams went on an international break, they all went away and played for their various nations. Um, and then they came back this weekend to resume, uh, round four. And, uh, again, um, Everton were playing, uh, this time Aston Villa, um, slightly different. Um, again, they were up to nil. Um, they had a lot of opportunities this time. Um, uh, as opposed to the Bournemouth game where they, that they, they actually didn't play really well. Um, at times that they, they played, they had, there was some good stuff in this game. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is that they, they ended up losing three, two again. Uh, so now they've gone uh, four games, no points, four losses, bottom of the of the table. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is what is going on in terms of the 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 mental vibe, the the feeling in the camp, the players, the support staff, the coach. Um, I mean, surely there's there's some self doubt there, even though these guys are are top of the you know they're they're, they're professional athletes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of a lot, a lot of it would um, a lot of it would depend on how that environment's set up. That's the first place my my mind sort of goes with this, right? So if the if it, I don't know the coach, I don't know, I don't know much about football to be honest. But my my immediate sort of thinking is that the the response to failure, that immediate response to that, are we are we? So it's something that's repeated. Maybe the goalkeeper let through some goals. The defenders almost probably feeling a little bit under the pressure with the way managers get treated in the, in the football thing. Like, surely the manager could be under the pump. Yeah, who knows, right? We don't know. But where my head immediately goes is about how the environment's set up. So the environment, if the coach, as an example, and the support staff, and maybe even the organization, right? sets up the environment in that this is a performance-based environment. We have to win. And, and that's the only sort of focus is on the outcome or on the result of, a, of performance. Then I think they could be really feeling the pressure and they could be severely under the pump. If the environment is set up more along learning and growing and, uh, you know, leveling up, and maybe it depends on what the coach's plan is and what they've agreed with the board, you know, I think... Um, we spoke about this offline you, uh, because I asked you the question and you sort of mentioned that he's been there for about two years now, 18 months, something like that. I think, I think, I think somewhere around 20 months. Yeah. You know, so, so that will all have an effect potentially on what's happening inside 
the environment. So if the environment's like really set up performance based, like I said, it'll it'll be really pressure, 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 under stress right now because we have to win and we're not doing that. And in fact, we're in winning positions and then we give them away. If it's more set up like a sort of learning environment or an environment that sees failure more as feedback rather than the end of the world, if we can see failure as feedback, then it says, okay, cool, yes, some feedback that we're receiving that in the last 10 minutes, we're busy stuffing things up. And so we've got to make sure that we, that we, that we learn from that. And so next time we'd be better at it, you know? That's, and, so, and, so, and equally, and equally, for example, if there were uh, strikers that didn't take opportunities to score additional goals, uh, i.e. go 3-0 up or, uh, or, or score a goal in the, in the time between them being up and, and actually ending up losing the game, um, they would probably beat themselves up a little bit if they weren't, if it was uh, for results based in their thought process. That's what you say. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So that could also be the learning. Like maybe we had five chances, five more chances at goal and we didn't actually take those. We could have been eight nil up, you know, then them scoring three goals is not the end of the world. Right. Or seven, sorry, because they were two nil up. Um, yeah, my maths lot let me down. Yeah, but so 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 they the you're a mental coach, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't too bad at math at school though. And two plus two plus five is not eight. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know, so 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 that so that's the that's the one side of things is that we it depends a lot on how the environment is um, how the environment is set, set up. up. Yeah. Um, and I had a thought about the second thought that I had, but now it seems to have disappeared out of my head. People who listen to the podcast will know that it's with me. Um, so I'm sure I'll find the thought. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating and interesting again, right? So that it could potentially become a little bit like a self-fulfilling prophecy. But, you know, so we could start taking on the identity that we're a team that's up and we lose. I found my thought. Right. See, it's coming. Yeah. There you uh, go. Came back. Came back quite quickly this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so so it could be a self fulfilling prophecy. So this wasn't my thought, but it's a, another point I wanted to make. That now we start taking on this identity that we can get ahead, but then we lose. And so I would, as a coach in that environment, I'd be sort of listening for that and try and be careful that we make sure that that's not sort of something that plays out regularly, right. consistently. That we try and nip that type of talk potentially in the bud and we just say right that's not how we want to think about ourselves is that you know this is the kind of team that we are so the thought i had was that very often when people are performing well right and things are going well and then performance almost like derailed without us really understanding like from the outside it might look like what the hell's happening now because like they're winning and now look at that and it's not just happened once it's happened twice so often, or you take a batter that gets consistent into the 30s, or maybe a golfer plays the first two rounds really well and then tends to the third and fourth round, right? It's just not the same. Or maybe a football player in the first half is really great. Or, you know, and in this example, maybe we tune up regularly and then we tend to let it go. What often happens is something changes mentally. Something changes. And normally it's described through a thought. Batters who get into the 30s, you know, maybe up to 30, they're in their process, they're doing their thing, they're watching the ball, they're playing straight, they've got their plans in place, they're executing, they get to 30, and then the thought comes and goes, don't stuff it up. Or maybe they've been batting a bit slowly and they get into the 30s and they say, okay, speed it up now. Or they get into the 30s and they go, uh, oh, 50s, you know, I can have 50 here today. Some might even go, I can get a hundred. This is easy. That's right. And inevitably when there's that type of change mentally, performance just it flatlines more often than not. And so right. if a team is busy repeating this, I would be curious as to what is changing. What is the difference? Maybe for the first, what's a football game? 40 minutes aside, 45 minutes aside? 45 minutes and a half. Yeah, plus so, extra time, which is anything to up to 15 minutes these days. Yeah, anyway. okay, but let's go up to 80 minutes, right? Up to 80 minutes. 80 minutes yeah, of so the, the game. game. The game is legit, is legitimately 90 minutes without any extra time. Yeah, but let's say up to 80 minutes, we, we're playing attacking football. 
And then we got a two more two nil lead, and then we might just start going. You know what? Um, we're ahead. Let's go defense. Or let's just sit back now. And as soon as we do that, boom, it allows maybe gaps and opportunities that we didn't have when we were looking to attack. And so, again, that might be something that I would be um, curious to just know what's actually happening in the environment or something that I would be aware of to check in with the players and the team. Are we changing? Are we doing something different? Because clearly, if we're doing something to get us to nil up, that should be good enough to play the last 10 minutes with to make sure that, you know, we, we either score again or we stay in the lead. The same for a batter. If it's good enough to get from 0 to 10, it should be get, good enough to get you to 20. It'll be good enough to get you to 30. And if it's good enough to get you to in the 30s, then just doing that same thing will get you to 50. We'll get you to 60. We'll get you to 100 eventually. But it's when we change that we get in trouble. Okay. Well, I, well, I, I keep thinking about, while I'm listening to you talking, I'm, I'm thinking to myself about something that I often hear commentators talk about. And that is um, winning breeds winning and losing breeds losing. Um, how does that how does that uh, connect to what 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 we're talking about? Well, well, one hundred percent. It's a, it, so like if if we're busy winning and that's working, whatever we're doing, and we keep doing that, well, then that keeps happening potentially, you know. Or I mean, you can never determine. You're never in control of the result or the outcome. It's always in the future. It's always away from your ability to control. But what you can control is how you show up, how you go into a performance. You can control your mindset, your state, your self-talk, uh, the images you're playing through them, your mind, what you're thinking about yourself and not position, uh, how you're approaching the first half, the second half, the first part of your innings, the first two rounds of golf, whatever it might be, the first 10 races around or laps around the track. You can, you can control all of how you show up. And so winning breeds winning essentially just says we find ourselves in a mental space that allows us to play in a way that let's say our brand is to attack and look to score goals and it gets us to move really well and all our practice is geared towards that. And we back that. And we then win. Then we know the recipe kind of works. We keep doing that. The likelihood of us keeping winning is pretty good. Although we're never in control of the team to sort of go up and down. Yay. Oh, yay. Oh, you know, we win. We feel great. We lose. Oh, we feel down. They might end up middle of the pack. And the teams who go through sort of a campaign and they're just like really down and not really seeing themselves even like, and, and if that's what you're seeing about yourself, we're not good enough. Like a lot of what we're talking about today is actually quite nicely intertwined, right? Um, then the likelihood of you actually winning comes less. So even though we're not guaranteed of the performance, when we set it up really well, when we show up in the best possible way, we increase the likelihood of it happening. And we're giving ourselves the best chance of, 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 of being in our best state to perform well, right? Yes, yes. And at the end of the day, state unlocks skill. So if I'm in my best state, this is where the cocktail analogy is such a cool thing, right? Um, if I'm in my best state, if I've got my best cocktail busy happening, and so ingredients we spoke about in today so far from a cocktail point of view is your identity and how you perceive yourself. There could be things in the cocktail around failure and feedback and how you take that on board. And then your state, and I think we've spoken about that component before, right? That the overall mixture of all of these things creates the cocktail and that is your state and from that we play your 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 skills show up your um you unlock ability, abilities so we often see people do things and then all, they'll come off the field and they'll go like i never knew i could do that right so it's it's a heightened state maybe and we can only get to that heightened state if we have a high level of skill so we've got to do our practice high level of skill and then co complete absorption into the moment right and there's more to it than that but at a simple level like it's that ability just completely completely getting lost in the moment um yeah but there's there's one more thing that i really would like to discuss with you just to end off um and and you and i both like a really good kobe bryant's meme or a little bit of motivation and inspiration right so i uh -huh. i spotted some yeah, I, I, I mean, I know what you're going to share here, and I, I maybe just want to say, like, so a lot of today has been around this idea of doubt, you know, or 
That's and, right. And, and we haven't mentioned the word, but like the com the flip side of that, maybe the confidence, right? And so I think this what you're going to sort of just share here quickly is pretty relevant to that. Yeah. So it was it was a um, uh, I wish I could remember who the gentleman was that was interviewing him, um, but he was he asked him a simple question. He he asked Kobe, "How do you deal with self doubt?" And and you could see by Kobe's reaction that you know, he he kind of said self doubt, uh, and he actually went on to say that uh, self doubt is such a strange thing. Uh, there will be times when you succeed, and then there will be times when you fail. Um, so wasting your time doubting whether you will be successful or not is pointless. He went on to say, just put one foot in front of the other. You control what you can control. And then you see what the outcome is. If you win, great. You're going to have to wake up the next day and do the journey again. If you lose, it sucks. But you're going to have to wake up the next day and do the journey again anyway. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Very good. And it ties in beautifully with what we've been talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. And I mean, he has a guy that's one of the best in the world ever at what he did, right? Um, I think he's no Legend. longer. I mean, he's no longer Legend. with us, but there's so many of his clips that float around the internet because I think what he did and what he achieved was above, right? And again, he was probably one of the hardest workers. But what I love about sure. him is that he wasn't just a hard worker on the field or on the court, right? He was a hard worker off the court. He was very aware of his mindset and how he thought and believed and showed up. Um, very aware of his cocktail, so to speak, you know, that... Would what you is call it? it optimism? Would yeah. you call it optimism? Well, so, so what... Yeah, I, I don't know if he necessarily... Maybe, right? But, but it is the place where my, my mind went to is that what I love about what he speaks about is that we can, it sort of alludes to this idea that we can actually choose. We're, we're actually empowered to choose the experience we want to have. So there's going to be success and there's going to be failure. Pieces. But we're going to have to do it all over again tomorrow. So I'm going to have to show up again and work again and check my mind again and check my skills again and improve and learn and grow and evolve. And it's a, it's a consistent process. It never stops. Never, ever. I'd imagine at the end of his career or someone like LeBron James, who's now been playing for who knows how long, he's still trying to get better. He's still trying to improve in something. Maybe it's a certain pressure moment. Maybe it's a certain skill that the youngsters are now doing. And as an old guy, I also want to learn to do that, you know? And so there's the... If, if I think of designing the experience that you want to have, I'm always, or, or being able to choose that, I'm always reminded of, and we've spoken about this uh, psychologist before, Dr. Michael Gervais. And it was such a short video clip. I've watched, listened to so many of his podcasts. I've uh, you know, read so many articles that he's written, but it was literally like a two minute Instagram real thing somewhere at some point in time, a couple of years ago, where I watched this thing where he spoke about what the great athletes just seem to be able to do. And uh, that obviously perked my ears up. And then he said the following, he said, uh, they tend to just believe that something great is about to happen. And I think that alludes to optimism, right? That alludes to this idea that the, that the best believe that something great is about to happen. And so even if they're down or they fail or they've um, not done well, there's something great in you know, and so what I actually did was for a long period of time, at least two years, I was very conscious about saying this to myself every single day. Um, so my self talk was like, a great thing's about to happen, a great thing's about to happen. And so whether I'm, I'm stuck in traffic, ah, it's a great thing, great things happening, you know, great thing, this is a great thing. Um, maybe I lost a client, okay, that's a great thing. Um, but in the same way, gain the client. That's a good thing. And so I think when I, when you orientate yourself, well, this was my experience in doing this little exercise. When you orientate your mind to say something great is going to happen, something great is busy happening. What it does is it makes everything that happens to you something to be gained from. 
So I'm, I failed today, but that was a great thing because I could learn today. You know, maybe previous times I wasn't open to learning this thing, I, but today I could, the, the great thing from today was I learned that I've got to move into space like this. So the great thing is that I got to, I know that that type of bowler troubles me. Or when my ball lies in this place on the golf course, it's actually that trips me up mentally. My skill is not there. That's a great thing to be able to have that awareness, to gain the awareness, to gain the insight, even in failure. Today was a great thing because we won. Why? Because we worked hard. It was a team effort. We stuck to our... So maybe I'm learning more about how to be successful. And so when we orientate ourselves more towards optimism by believing good things are happening rather than, oh, geez, yeah, this always happens to me, this bad thing. You know, I always make this mistake. Well, if, if your head sort of sits in that, maybe pessimism would be the opposite, right? If, you're, if your mind is stuck in that, then I think it's really difficult for life to move. Well, let me let me rephrase this. I believe, and hey, I might be completely wrong about this, but it's my sort of understanding at this point in time is that life just happens. Some good things happen, bad things happen. The world revolves. Everything, the ocean waves keep coming and going, and everything is changing all the time. So if something bad came my way or something I perceive as bad, well, maybe tomorrow something good comes because kind of like the ocean waves pull in and or wash on the shore and pull back i don't know i find it's it a great flow, analogy it's the flow of life it's, it's the, the flow, flow of life, life right there's start there's growth there's death right there's that circle that to everything and so when we can perceive all of that is as great in not in the sense of sort of stand on top of the mountain and go yay but great for our experience great for us in some way benefiting us in some way then I think our interaction with life and our ability to navigate the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows of life and sport and the pressure that comes with it, it might not become easier in the sense of that the sport or the performances and the pressures are easier. But I think the preparation and the time away and the fallout, whether it was good or bad, becomes a lot more beneficial to our overall journey and our overall growth. That's a very cool place to end to end our conversation today. Uh, yeah. I'm loving that. <laughs> loving that. I mean, yeah. that, regardless of regardless of whether you're a performance athlete or or not, that that is a, a wonderful outlook on to have on life. Yeah. In, yeah. in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Justin, I've enjoyed this conversation like all the others, right? Um, Thoroughly. I think that. Thank you. Um, yeah. No. Thank you to you. And uh, um, I. I I want to encourage anybody that if they found value from this to maybe please share it, subscribe, like, follow, comment, give us feedback, right? Um, yeah, we love feedback. At the end of the day, this, uh, this little performance formula talk show is about adding value and it is about sharing some messages and it's about learning from other people. So um, if we just keep it to ourselves, then we're not, uh, in my mind, you know, then growing. We, yeah. We're not growing. And, and we're not growing our community. We're not growing the things that happen around us. We could be seen as selfish, you know. And so please share. Please tell other people about the podcast. Um, and uh, keep, please keep being your awesome, your awesome self in, in the process. That was cool, Jodes. Mm, thank you, Love Justin. It. I'll see you next week. Take care. Look after yourself and everybody Cheers. out there. Take care. Cheers.